Welcome to this session of the Tourette Association's virtual conference. I am Jen Kadaru, Communications Coordinator at the Tourette Association. Thank you for joining us today for classroom strategies and accommodations for students with TS. We want to thank our platinum sponsors, the Warner Fund and Pharma, as well as all of our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To support educational programming like this, you may visit Tourette.org slash contribution to make a gift today. Now, during the session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question pane on the right side of your GoToWebinar uh, player at any time. You will collect your questions and address them in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Stanger. Dr. Jennifer Stanger has been an educator for over 20 years. She was a high school English teacher for 13 years and has been a school counselor for seven years. She's also an adjunct professor and a member of the TA's Education Advisory Board. Thank you so much for being here. You may now go ahead with your presentation. Thank you all for joining me. I believe um, the majority of us are probably parents and I'm so happy that you have joined um, because what I like about this what this presentation um, is as a classroom teacher, as a high school English teacher, what I talk about here are strategies and accommodations that any teacher can do, even if your child doesn't have an IEP or a 504 plan. These are just simple things that we can, you know, simple adjustments that, that we can make to make life easier um, and and academic success more possible for your child. So th thank you so much for joining and I'm going to jump right in. So this presentation, we're going to start off with basic a, a basic understanding of Tourette syndrome and other tick disorders. I want to focus on the impact that Tourette syndrome has on students and then lots of times um, it's it's not the actual Tourette syndrome, but the co-occurring conditions that can um, potentially impact academic success and classroom performance. So we want to spend some time talking about some of those co-occurring co conditions. And then I end with with um, simple classroom strategies and techni techniques that we can use when um, working with students who have Tourette syndrome. And then I hope that you could share it with teachers, administrators. Um, it's to advocate for your student. So let's jump in. Just kind of a brief overview of Tourette syndrome, um, the prevalence of Tourette syndrome. We have one out of 160 children between the ages of five and 17, so school age children in the United States are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. However, we have one out of every 100 one out of 100 children has Tourette syndrome or some other type of tick disorder. Um, and even though that we know that number is one out of 100, there are an, an estimated 50% of people in our, in our country who go undiagnosed. So Tourette syndrome is definitely a neurodevelopmental disorder. Ticks typically noticed when a child is between the ages of five and seven. Um, ticks will typically increase in frequency and severity between the ages of eight and 12 years old. Most people with Tourette syndrome show noticeable improvement in late adolescence and some uh, even become tick free. I was not one of those of those people. Um, I definitely still have uh, Tourette syndrome into my adult life in my early 40s, um, but approximately one quarter of people with Tourette syndrome will continue to have persistent, even severe ticks into adulthood. And um, I like to say that it's not always, but when I talk about that ticks are typically noticed when a child is between the ages of, of five and seven, I, I, one thing I do like is, is as we progress through you know, the 21st century, there just is more knowledge about Tourette syndrome. Obviously, we all know that there are plenty of people who don't know what Tourette syndrome is when they become introduced to us or our family, but I will say we've come a long way from from the 80s when I was in school because even um, you know my father was in education, but when I started having ticks, probably at four or five, you know we just um, 
as typical back then kind of thought they were just quirks or or habits you know so i had ticks for years and years before i was um, finally diagnosed so let's talk about ticks ticks are involuntary repetitive movements and vocalizations it feels like that a physiological urge that is just difficult to ignore or suppress and then ticking actually only provides some temporary relief from the urge and when we talk about that uh, urge that is hard to ignore or suppress, I just did a uh, presentation about an hour and a half ago for, for kids, and I always compare it to a sneeze. It sort of feels like you have to sneeze. You have that funny feeling in your nose, and you can try to put it off, and you can try not to sneeze, but eventually we know we're, we're all going to sneeze. You can't, you know, you can't not sneeze, and that's very similar to the feeling you get um, when you have to tick. Um, ticks can range from mild to severe and can be self-injurious and debilitating. Some can be so mild that, you know, they can, people don't necessarily notice them. And we'll talk about different types of ticks coming up. Um, and one thing though, ticks definitely regularly change in the type, the frequency and severity, you know, a very inconsistent. Um, and I will also say when they change in type, I remember, um, you know, in college having a tick and I would be like, oh, this is so distracting. And um, over time, you'll find that you will stop doing some ticks. And I always tell my kids when I'm talking to school age kids, unfortunately, though, there's usually some other new tick that pops up to take its place. So, you know, I, I probably have some ticks that I've had my whole life, but I definitely have ones that have um, come about and then, uh, you know, then are no longer. So types of ticks, we have um, motor ticks and vocal ticks. So we'll start with mo motor ticks. We have simple motor ticks and complex motor ticks. The simple ones are some of those ones that, that when I say people might not even um, notice. And it also depends on the severity. You know, you can blink your eyes, but then you can blink them so severely that it's more of a facial grimace. Um, but these are all, all actually simple motor ticks and jaw movements head bobbing or jerking, shoulder shrugging, shoulder shrugging, neck stretching and arm jerking. I had a lot of simple motor tics and a lot of them, I always tell um, school age children, dealt with like um, popping my um, joints. So like I would, I would try to pop my knuckles or pop my neck or pop even my elbows. So that was just something that, uh, that I seemed to do. Complex motor tics, uh, usually involve multiple muscle groups or combinations of movements. Um, examples can be hopping, twirling, jumping, sticking out tongue, kissing, pinching. So some, you know, you 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 might be touching other people um, with complex motor tics. And vocal tics, simple ones, don't even always have to be words. Many times it's it's like a sniffing or a coughing clearing your throat, grunting, um, or shouting. And I remember one of the first ticks I had, it was sounded kind of like a sniff. I was actually blowing out a little bit, like I would, I would blow out through my nose. And I just kind of always did that, even though I didn't have a cold, I didn't have allergies. Um, complex vocal ticks are going to be words or phrases, which may or may not be recognizable. Um, and they can occur in and out of context. And that's what can be difficult, um, you know, when, when <clears throat> excuse me, when things are suggestible. And so then you are kind of commenting in context. And so we definitely have um, some of the more uh, severe cases of the vocal tics or the coprolalia, echolalia, and paleolalia, where you are, you know, um, unfortunately, I always say the coprolalia, it, due to the sensationalism of media, sometimes that's the only um, bit about Tourette syndrome that people know. I remember in college when I would tell somebody that I had Tourette syndrome and it, it was not uncommon to hear, oh, you cuss or oh, do you cuss? And, and you know, yes, about 10 to 12, no, less than 12 percent um, of the population of Tourette syndrome has that coprolalia, but I, again, because that is, you know, sensationalized in the media, that's, that's what everybody um, first thinks about. So 
Complex sy symptoms can be difficult to recognize, support, and understand. Um, when I talked about um, ticks changing, um, symptoms definitely wax and wane during different periods of your life. And I definitely would agree that stress increases symptoms. Um, also for me, when I'm super tired, lack of sleep, um, I'm finding out more um, in my adult life that a lot of people with Tourette syndrome struggle with insomnia. And I told my neurologist, well, that doesn't seem fair <laughs> because my tics are worse when I don't have enough sleep and I often don't have enough sleep. So um, stress and being tired definitely increases my symptoms. Um, symptoms can be suggestible for many people and the ability to suppress symptoms seems to be inconsistent and can vary from one person to the next. Um, just to kind of throw in a, a short little personal story, I have always found like I could be in a wedding. I could, you know, um, stand up in front of a church and then go to the reception and and like people that did not know me at all that are there at the wedding would probably not have known. I can sometimes, you know, escape to the bathroom and let out some ticks. However, for me, um, there's usually a little like what I call a rebound period where, you know, the next day my ticks are going to be way worse than usual just from that, you know, the concentration of, of trying to suppress. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because many students um, struggle in the classroom. And I know that lots of kids don't want to tick. And so then you're focusing on that so much and well, it can be draining and you also miss other, you know, you miss, a, you, you might miss a, a good portion of the lecture when the teacher is explaining something because you're really having that internal dialogue with yourself. Don't tick, don't tick, don't tick. Um, so that's why it can be difficult um, as a student with threat syndrome. Also, many times we're also trying to manage some of the co-occurring conditions. I love this little box off to the side. Um, where where we commonly say the only thing consistent about Tourette syndrome is the inconsistencies. So here's some data um, that I found on students in schools with Tourette syndrome. So children with Tourette syndrome are four times as likely to have at least one co-occurring condition compared to non-Tourette children. In children with Tourette syndrome, 80% had at least one co-occurring condition. So um, these, these students, these children with threat, are much more likely to have mental, emotional, or behavior dis behavioral disorders, um, ADHD, OCD, and LD. Um, so attention def deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and learning disability are the most common co-occurring conditions. But students with Tourette syndrome, Tourette syndrome can often have difficulty controlling their anger, trouble sleeping, higher levels of the self-injurious behavior um, than those with non-co-occurring conditions. Um, so again, I just like to point out, obviously we have lots of children, school-aged children without Tourette syndrome who have ADHD or who have a learning disability or OCD, but you are four times as likely to have one of those if you also have Tourette syndrome. Um, we know that children with Tourette syndrome are being educated in both our mainstream education setting and our special education settings. Um, and while all students with Tourette syndrome do not need special education services, we do need to have specific educational interventions that we can put in place when a student is falling behind academically, when their tics are so severe that they interfere with the student's learning or participation in the classroom. That could be as, um, just like the, the example I gave a few minutes ago when the child is kind of having that, that intense internal dialogue so they're missing a lot of the instruction of the lecture or, or whatever, the, the science experiment, and, and they're not, you know, they're not absorbing as much as they could because they're trying to concentrate on managing their tics. Um, if a student has difficulties with peer relations or if the self-esteem is in danger, all reasons why we um, need to have school-based interventions readily available. Social emotional concerns. So difficulties in school impact both your academic performance and one's social adjustment. 
from the ages of seven to 12, ticks can have the greatest effect on a child's self-esteem as well as his or her peer and family relationships. And at times, due to the negativity associated with the presence of ticks, teasing by classmates can lead to social difficulty and anxiety in social situations. This then causes um, students or, 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 or children to withdraw socially. And when you withdraw socially, you can often experience depression, low self-esteem, and a lack of self-confidence. So there are definitely some concerns why we want to, you know, um, help the social emotional well-being of a child. So let's talk about some of these co-occurring conditions. I think my first slide is a diagram. You might have seen it before. I just love this one. Um, when you, we say that Ticks are really just the tip of the iceberg, okay? So above the water, that's what you can see. That's what's visible. And, you know, my, my motor ticks and vocal ticks, everybody can see those, but there's so much that could be going on underneath the surface that plays into <clears throat> behavior and, and academic success for kids with threat syndrome. So there might be dysgraphia, handwriting difficulties, anxiety, impulsivity, sensory processing issues, behavior, rage, dis disinhibition, just to name a few. So there's a lot that makes Tourette syndrome a, you know, very complex when you have some of these co-occurring conditions. A few that I wanna focus on, we're not gonna talk about all of them, but let's spend a moment on Tourette's, um, OCD versus what I would call classic OCD. So our classic obsessive compulsive disorder is when an individual's symptoms are linked with ritual compulsion behaviors in attempts to manage the anxiety and the fear that the individual experiences related to the obsession. So if um, I am afraid that somebody could break into my house, at night while I'm sleeping. So I must check every single window and every single door to make sure that it's locked two, three, four or more times. So I'm walking around, you know, very ritual ritualistically through the house. That is to manage the fear that I believe somebody could break in while I'm sleeping. And that's more of your classic OCD. Tourette's OCD the symptoms overlap more closely with the individual's experience of tics. And uh, you might hear somebody say that they need to do something or say something in a certain way or at a given time or until it feels just right. And this behavior is driven by an urge rather than a fear. And looking back at my childhood, I definitely had Tourette's OCD. Um, and I, I never really realized it before. So like, for instance, um, we had a basketball hoop in our driveway, you know, and my sister and I sometimes would just shoot baskets messing around after school or in the summer. And if you know anything about basketball, um, I would be dribbling the ball and sometimes I would accidentally like dribble it off the top of my shoe or off my, my foot. And then, so the ball's not gonna bounce back up. It's gonna like roll straight, straight into the grass or straight into the road, you know? And so I would run back to retrieve it and my sister would just, just kind of be waiting. She wouldn't say anything because she would know that I would have to start dribbling it again a few times and then purposely bounce it off my other foot because it just didn't feel right to hit the, you know, the foot or the shoe or my toes um, on one foot and not the next. And that was kind of one of the things my sister just knew was coming. I, I probably told her about it before, but I would just always have to do that. And that's, that's a, a my my example of Tourette's OCD. Both of these types are common in, in children or adults with Tourette syndrome. So Tourette syndrome and OCD. OCD is far more common in children and adults with Tourette syndrome than without Tourette syndrome. So students may feel that urge to do and redo activities until things feel, look, or sound just right. Like I said, they might be distracted by impulsive thoughts and desires to perform compulsive behaviors. 
Um, and often students have difficulty transitioning from one task to the other because they feel like they have not finished the first task. Sensory processing disorder. Students who have Tourette syndrome and who also have sensory issues may experience or exhibit um, feeling overwhelmed by too much sensory input in like a loud or chaotic environment. So I always say, think the cafeteria, recess, a PE, music, or art class. Another one I like to say that I haven't added to this slide is the bus. For many people, the bus can just be too much sensory input, tra traveling um, you know, to school and from school on the school bus. Some students have a need for excess excessive sensory input. Um, and that is where like they are purposely um, bumping into things. So, like they might purposely walk in and, and let the, the desk hit their leg or brush up against the, um, the door frame because they need that sensory input. Chewing on clothes or the body and excessive touching, hitting, um, hurting self, jumping or kicking. That's kind of, kind of uh, follows in with the need for excessive sensory input. I always um, enjoy as I do more research um, as an adult with Tourette syndrome, uh, uh, looking back in my childhood and saying, oh, yeah, I did that. I didn't realize it was a sensory processing disorder. But I, I specifically remember like uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, so junior high time. If you would look at my uh, like a big ballpoint pen, that was the one where the cap would pull off, the caps would be mangled. I would put them in my mouth and just kind of like chew on them as I took notes or even like the old number school, I'm sorry, the old number two um, pencils. Like I just had these little like bite marks all throughout them. And um, I would always just be chewing on my pen as I took notes in class or chewing on my pencil. And I never really thought a thing about it until kind of doing research for presentations like this. Um, definitely in the school situation or the school setting, an occupational therapist can recommend strategies for a sensory plan. Um, individualized to for each student. So let's talk about executive function challenges, um, including ADD and ADHD, but not limited to. Um, so executive function is a mental, a set of mental processes that can help connect past experience with present action and act and, and I'm sorry, and enable individuals to perform activities such as planning, organizing, strategizing, paying attention to detail, um, remembering details, all while managing space and time. So I, for years, was a high school English teacher. I always think about like writing an essay and how we do that in steps. You know, we, we plan, we organize, sometimes we write an outline, we strategize, and you know, you're keeping all of this in your time frame for doing this or allowing a student the time for writing an essay. Imagine how difficult that would be if we had um, executive functioning challenges, okay? Um, impossible almost. Um, so students with executive function challenges do benefit from the, these types of support. Um, support with transitions. Um, so sometimes just letting them know um, Hey, we're going to be, you know, we always used to do this in the mornings, but now this will be coming up on Wednesday or this will be coming up on Friday. Even just giving them plenty of time to know that there's going to be something a little bit different in their regular routine. Um, beginning and completing tasks and assignments. I always like to have something that I can hand out and, and give to a student so that they can put it on their desk and physically cross it out, highlight it as they accomplish things. You know, um, as a teacher, if you try to say things out loud, you know, you could try to say it 17 times, but it's better to have it on the board where people can see it. But even for my students with, with executive function challenging, I, even if it's just like a half sheet of paper or a post-it note, I like to give some, them something, a hard copy that they could put right there on their desk. Um, they can benefit from support with remembering what to do. So that kind of has that to-do list that I hand them. Decreasing rigid rigidity and recognizing that others have different opinions and developing lifelong strategies to demonstrate their true abilities. All of these support. 
Anxiety is another big one for uh, a co-occurring condition of Tourette syndrome. Anxiety can have a cumulative effect throughout the day. So a student who um, has Tourette syndrome is trying to manage their tics, attempt to suppress their tics at times, control their anxiety and other co-occurring conditions. So sometimes these things just build um, throughout the day. And when students are not sufficiently supported to manage their anxiety, there can often be an undesirable reaction or outcome. So, um, you know, if we are talking about toddlers, we call that a meltdown, you know, or in the school age or school setting, we call that acting out. So there's just usually going to be some sort of like, you know, blow up where they've had too much. Um, working with students to recognize when they are over, overloaded and what they can use, what they can do, what strategies they can use to help reduce their anxiety um, just helps, you know, being self-aware and, and having tips, and we'll talk about some tips coming up, um, can help them manage their anxiety. Clinical anxiety and subclinical stress anxiety can both exacerbate tics. Many people, students with Tourette syndrome, also suffer from written language deficits. So um, written language deficits or dysgraphia characteristics can include, and they're different, but they're all different types of dysgraphia. Some people have very slow and laborious writing. Some people, it's very sloppy handwriting, like it could be uneven spacing, irregular margins, inconsistent lettering, um, incorrect capitalization or punctuation, or um, the inability to correctly copy from book to paper or from the board to the piece of paper. Inability to organize thoughts on paper is another common one, and perfectionism. Some people, you know, um, just get focused on making it look a certain way so that they're just constantly um, erasing, or some students can't draw a line through something, so they have to start all over if they're writing in pen. Um, so these are all. Um, examples of dysgraphia. I found the older I, I get, I am, my handwriting is getting worse and worse, but I have some nerve damage um, from a tick I did for years with my neck. And so my hands, my fingers, and most of my hands are numb. And I feel like that's played into, um, it's becoming more difficult for me to write. So a little bit laborious, but definitely harder to, uh, to read for other people also. So a good way to evaluate if a student has dysgraphia is to have them write at length on a non-favorite topic during a type of day that is typically difficult for them. For most school-aged children, that is without a doubt the afternoon after they're tired, after they've possibly consumed a lot of sugar at lunch or what, you know, it's just the end of the day. Um, that's usually when their concentration is least. So um, having them write at something they don't love, right? Not, not something that they have a lot of knowledge on, something that is more of an assignment, not something that's a hobby. Students with threat syndrome and co-occurring conditions can all have similar challenges, even though the sources of difficulty may differ. And so I use the example of dysgraphia. And the, these are like, could be three different students with threat syndrome. And one student might have difficulty writing by hand because of their learning disability and because of motor issues. Another student with OCD um, because of intensity of focus and that desire for perfection. That would be like my student who I said, you know, had to write, make their G's look a certain way or make the loop of a G look a certain way or they had to start all over again, cross it out, erase, sometimes use a new piece of paper and that, can be um, become such a focus on on perfecting the handwriting that they lose um, sight of what what they should be doing. And then students for ADHD because of lack of focus and distractibility. I guess kind of an example that I use for the second one could play in that as as well. But sometimes if the writing is so difficult, especially if you're you know you have that attention deficit, you could um, you know get distracted, forget what you should be doing, and it's easy to, um, when you see all these examples, it doesn't become difficult to realize 
okay, so now I see why some of these kids aren't completing their homework, right? They don't have it finished 100% because of issues like this. So here is where it, um, a supportive teacher can be so important, okay? And so let's talk about how teachers can help. In a qualitative study of students with Tourette syndrome, it was found that children who were the happiest and most successful were those that felt that their teachers were understanding and respectful to their feelings and to their needs. Teachers that um, create a safe and caring classroom environment where students do not feel threatened or ostracized. Um, and when students, I have always said this, only when students feel safe can they truly learn. You know, like if they're worried, uh, any reason, like as a, as a teacher, I always talked about how we can't we can't make fun of other people. If somebody's worried about somebody going to make fun of their sneakers or their backpack, you know that's their focus, and not listening to the lecture or not doing what they should be doing. So it's when teachers can create that environment of a safe and caring classroom where everybody feels accepted, um, that's usually where students are going to thrive. And teachers can do all of this by modeling person first language and that's where i talk about um, being a person with tourette syndrome or a person in a wheelchair um, you know a person with a disability not a disabled person you don't use the adjective to describe the person you always talk about the person first um, teachers can model acceptance and a support with the you know the mantra all are valued here this is our classroom this is a safe space everybody has a value here we all value each other. And teachers obviously can also be key in educating classroom classmates, students using age appropriate language and examples. So that might look different if I'm a second grade teacher versus a middle school teacher or a high school teacher. But um, you know, I think it's key in helping educate other students um, as to what, what Tourette syndrome is and, and that somebody in our class has that. And, and, and that's why you might see or hear some of the things that you see in here. And I'm a huge believer that knowledge is power. That's why um, education is so key. Um, I actually didn't, as I started teaching, I didn't disclose to all my students that I had Tourette's, Tourette's syndrome. And so, you know, I always tell people, it's usually the lack of knowledge about Tourette syndrome that creates negative attitudes. Um, and, and many times that's just because if I'm ticking, um, you know, doing something with my elbow over and over again, and I don't discuss it at all, like I know my students can be like, what's what's going on here? And, and they're confused or uncomfortable because we're not talking about it. And, and in society, we don't like to feel uncomfortable, right? It's a tense feeling. Nobody knows what to do or quite what to say. And oftentimes in that situation, we make a joke about something because laughter, right? Laughter makes everything better, okay? It's gonna alleviate a tense situation. So sometimes kids would just do something to kind of make a joke because we don't have the words to, to understand. We don't understand what's going on. We're not talking about it. I'm uncomfortable. And so those are lots of reasons where, why I would find students would sometimes, um, you know, make a joke or, or want to mock me. And I have found since um, when, I, when I wrote my dissertation about being a teacher with Tourette syndrome, and when I started disclosing on the first day, students, by and large, they, they're just so resilient. They're going to take it in stride. I feel like they they are like, okay, I you know, they might ask some questions, but then they're accepting. They understand what's going on, and by and large, they're going to be more tolerant and supportive of of a student once they know, you know, why they do the things they do. And I think um, knowledge, education, definitely contributes to a reduction in teasing, bullying, and avoidance by classmates. A short little personal story. Um, I didn't always disclose in my first few years of teaching. And then at one time, a student came up to me and she was on, on the school newspaper and she wanted, to, I, I, th I can't remember exactly what their assignment was in the journalism class, but right, a, 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 right about a, a strong teacher in some way. And so she wanted to write about me. And I thought at first I was like, oh my gosh, like I teach at a very big high school. Like I only have a fraction of the students in my class. I, I'm not usually open about this. And then I thought, oh my gosh, 
what a great way to let everybody know, even the ones that aren't in my classroom, uh, of you know why why they see me doing the things I do. And I will remember the first day the newspaper was released on campus that day, and I had got gotten copies to actually hand out to all my students. And I remember saying to one of my junior classes, I just I was always a energetic teacher, and so at the start the bell rang, and I said. So it turns out I'm famous. I'm in the newspaper today. And I said, I'm gonna hand this all out. I want you guys to read this story. I'll, I'll be feel feel free to sign autographs at the end, you know. And so then I gave them some time to read uh, the story. And one little girl raised her hand right away. And, and I had actually taught her the year before. So I had her in the classroom two years in a row. And she shared with, with our class, she said, oh my gosh, Miss Stinger, the first time you had a ticket scared me to death because I, didn't, I thought you were gonna fall down. I thought, is she having a seizure? And she said, and now she said, I don't even really hear those things anymore. I just know that it's something I'm gonna hear in D203. That was my classroom, um, the name of my room, D203. She said, I just kind of know that's something that I'll hear when I'm in here. And it doesn't even really, you know, it doesn't, I don't even notice it anymore. So I always like to give that example when I'm talking to students or youth ambassadors about, how, how knowledge is power. And here's how peers can help. Um, you know, once we have that knowledge, it creates uh, a care, concern, and the acceptance of everyone. Like I, um, like I said, it teaches us empathy. We all have something, you know, it could be something very visible, like my Tourette syndrome, or it could be something that you, is not visible, you know, like, um, somebody might have suffered the death of somebody in the family or even a lifelong uh, favorite pet, you know, and where you don't see that, but they are grieving, they're carrying that burden. And so we, we all have something and it just teaches us to, to care, care about everybody. Um, and classmates, usually after they have been educated, they in turn can help educate others. And I feel like that's important, especially with like substitute teachers, right? Or maybe a new student or somebody who doesn't have that, um, they see like a bus driver or a cafeteria worker or somebody who's uh, supervising the gym or the playground and they can help um, spread the word and, and let other people know. And it's just it definitely that knowledge, knowledge is power. I always said, say that. I also like um, perception. I feel like perception is, is everything. And when we have the knowledge, about Tourette syndrome, it, it can be what we need to change somebody's negative perception. So when you have a negative perception uh, about the behavior that a child with Tourette syndrome is displaying, if you've got that negative um, thoughts, like maybe you're just having a really rough day in the classroom and, and this teacher might think, this student is really pushing my buttons, like she he, he is being mean, he's being dis disrespectful or even he's deliberately trying to get the class um, you know distracted or off task and when you feel that way you tend to feel these types of things angry or threatened you know you, you don't want to lose the the classroom management so that might be threat you feel threatened that you're going to lose that and when you feel this way it's easy easier for your behavior to be i'm going to offer an ultimatum you know or i'm going to punish you like if you don't stop that this is going to happen and so um, when we educate more people on Tourette syndrome, it's easier to turn that negative perception into a positive perception. And then, oh, sorry, I forgot to say on, on the negative perception, sometimes you feel like this student is the problem today. The student is the problem. But when you have a more positive perception, it's not that the student is the problem. The student has a problem. So when, I'm feel, when I think that way, I could think, wow. Sally's got to be really discouraged today. Her tics are a lot worse than usual. I bet she's feeling very frustrated. I bet she's really unhappy today. And when I think that way, of course, I'm gonna feel empathetic. I'm gonna feel concerned. Um, and when you feel that way, your behavior is easier to, uh, you, it's more likely to be, I'm gonna be supportive of Sally. I'm going to encourage, I'm gonna try to help her out. And, I know I, I do give a lot of little personal stories. I think it makes it more relatable. I gave a presentation um, to a middle school 
a group of middle school teachers. So I, I talked at like their faculty meeting when they had a student with Tourette syndrome. And <laughs> I once had this story shared with me about another middle school boy. Um, so he had this vocal tick that popped up. He was in sixth grade and he had this vocal tick where he started saying trains, like a, a train all day, you know, like he was just in the middle of class. It could be in the cafeteria. Um, you know, in the hallways, he just kept saying trains and, and like by the third or fourth day, the teachers in the middle school were, were saying like, oh, I just wish he would stop saying trains. I'm just so tired of hearing that. And typical of our ticks, how they change over time. Suddenly, after I don't know how long it had been, but after some time, this young sixth grade boys, um, the word that he kept repeating so morphed, it changed from trains into boobs. So you can imagine being in a middle school, six, sixth grade, and some kids saying boobs over and over again. By the end of the first day, the teachers were like, oh, we just wish you'd go back to saying trains. And so it's kind of all about, you know, perspective and perception. And I just, I like to throw that in there about, you know, perspective is everything. So let's talk about strategies to support students with Tourette syndrome. These are all things that I did as a teacher, okay? They are very easy things to do. It doesn't have to have a written out 504 plan or an IEP, just ways to help out a kid that you know struggles. And, and a lot of these don't necessarily have to be a student with Tourette syndrome. It could be, you know, one of my kids with ADHD, just things, kids that I knew had a lot of energy. So physical arrangement of the room. Simply allowing adequate space for the student with Tourette syndrome to move around and let out some ticks, um, you know, and I always find, well, like when I was in graduate school, was to have my desk on the end of a row, not necessarily the front of the classroom or the back, but to be on the side. And that way I could kind of slide my desk out just a little bit so I had more space. So I'm pretty tall and I have long arms and this, this arm jerking tick I would do, like I could literally easily accidentally hit somebody else's arm or hit their desk. So I would just kind of move my desk out a little bit, even if it's just sometimes a few, you know, four or five inches, just to give me a little bit more space where I felt, you know, not that I was going to be consumed with worrying about ticks and disrupting or hitting somebody else on accident. Um, have a student seated next to a buddy. Buddies can help with note taking or other tasks. Um, usually there's always some student who is, you know, extra nurturing and, you know, a great buddy. I, I just could always find um, people that would make good buddies. And, and, you know, that could be somebody help with note taking or somebody who, you know, kept knocking things off their desk and th that would be more than willing to jump, you know, bend over and help pick things up. So they can help when you know if if a student's ticks are a little bit more intense that day and they miss some things they can help supply those notes or just answer any questions and be supportive another easy one that i i utilized often was allowing my student um to be a helper slash assistant so i could ask them to erase the board hand out papers collect papers open a window, take something to an office, to the office for me, just because I knew they might need to, you know, expel a little bit of energy, or maybe it would give them the opportunity to kind of get some ticks out in a less obtrusive way. I mean, sometimes I would make something up to go to the office, right? Like I'd be like, hey, can you send this note to the secretary? And I'd staple it shut, you know, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't really be an errand at all. It would be, I needed to allow that kid to be able to go to the office and then come back. Handwriting accommodations. This is actually getting easier and easier, um, especially now that all schools at some times last year or this year were remote only because of quarantine, because of COVID. Um, there are lots of um, things that we can do. So one, allowing students to type and submit homework electronically. More and more teachers are using Google Classroom or many students have email. And if the student has trouble writing this or they're going to lose that homework between going home, finishing and bringing it back the next day, if they can submit it to me electronically, that's great. You know, some kids will um, 
take a picture of their homework and then email it to the teacher. And that works also. There's a lot of talk to text software options out there now that can dictate the spoken word into a typed document, similar to when we use, you know, Siri or talk to text as we are um, dictating um, into our phones. And um, so that a lot of op software options and that way, especially, you know, if you have that dysgraphia, this is a one way to um, bypass that. Allow students to give a verbal response instead of an essay. I think this is very, as an English teacher, this was great for some students. If, if they just had trouble organizing and um, getting thoughts on paper, allow them to come back to my, you know, my desk and just let's have a conversation. And, and if they had points that they knew they needed to make, they might have them on a note card. But um, it was definitely more manageable than um, than an entire typed out or writ, handwritten out essay. Finally, limiting the number of homework problems to focus on mastering the concept being taught, not the quantity. That might be, you know, just doing the odd math problems, showing me that you know the content, but it's just not that, you know, uh, dr drill of, of doing 25 problems each night if it's going to take way longer to do that many. Schedules and routines. We talked about this a little bit before, but ticks are often more severe and frequent when a student is tired, fatigued, or even excited, okay? So if it's this is a lot easier in an elementary school than maybe a high school or middle school where you change periods each day, but if lessons and activities that require a lot of close attention to detail, if they could be scheduled earlier in the day, perhaps when a student's focus is a little bit better before they get tired, um, that, that could be beneficial. Conversely, Activities that are interesting to students with Tourette syndrome or to students in general, you know, could be scheduled later in the day because our tics tend to decrease when we're engaged in something that we really like or really interesting um, to us. So those activities, it'd be easier to push those back later in the day after lunch um, and then have those more difficult activities earlier. Also, very important to teach. Um, we talked a little bit about with anxiety, but self-calming techniques, whether you're anxious or whether you're angry or whether you're just having a lot of ticks, if you can kind of, you know, bring yourself down, calm yourself down, hopefully that can bring your, you know, your, your ticks down so they're not so frequent or severe. And there are lots of different ways. I, I haven't mentioned nearly all of them, but sometimes belly breathing, just taking a few deep breaths. Um, you know, if you get a test and all of a sudden you're thinking, I don't know any of these questions, I don't know any of these questions, just shutting your eyes, taking a few deep breaths, and then starting again. Deep, mu deep muscle relaxation, mindfulness, guided imagery, meditation, or just taking a break, sometimes stepping away, and that's why it's got its own slide here. Really, taking a break to regroup can help lots of us. So. Um, this doesn't have to be like I raise my hand and ask the teacher for permission. It, I feel like it works best when there's like a pre-arranged signal between the teacher and the student to kind of communicate the need to step out of the classroom without having to ask. And this can work both ways. You know, the teacher can signal because sometimes, especially for my younger um, school age children, they don't always recognize when things are building and, hey, it might be beneficial if I step out for a minute. And so if the teacher can say that to the student, then they can realize, oh, maybe I would a break would be better for me. So if you can, and then also conversely, the student can give this a special signal to the teacher. At any rate, it's so that the student can step out of the room without even having to call much um, attention to himself or, or stop what's going on in the classroom. And it's best if there's a pre-identified area where the student can go to take a short break. That could be the hallway, the gym, just to, for the quick restroom or water fountain. Could be the counselor's office, the library, the nurse's office, just some space where the student can regroup, relieve ticks, reduce stress, and possibly the occurrence of, of ticks. Um, they can also 
you know, have a few minutes to do these types of things also. Grab a stress ball or a squeeze ball. Um, if they really enjoy listening to music or they like to draw or color, they can do that for a few minutes. Um, take a short walk or practice relaxation exercises in the hopes that two to five minutes later, we can go back into the classroom and kind of have a little bit of a like a reset where, okay, I, I've stepped away a little bit. Hopefully, you know, I will be able to concentrate. I won't be so worked up. My ticks won't be so um, intrusive or severe that, that I'm having difficulty um, grabbing, you know, gleaming the content of the lesson. So that wraps up all of the informational um, part that I had. I have a few sources here of other great resources and supports available through the Tourette Association. Um, and I think I have one more slide. I want to show lots of other um, tools for parents, for educators, youth ambassador, the ambassador program. So just some kind of great resources. Please check out the Tourette Association website. Lots of great resources on there. And Jen, do I have a slide on the back here? Do you want to take over? Yes, we'll start the Q&A portion. So thank you, Dr. Stenger, for an excellent presentation that was all super insightful. Um, so yeah, we're going to now start answering some of the questions submitted during the presentation. We have a ton of great questions so far. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your control <coughs> panel. And if we are unable to get to all of the questions submitted, um, we will be following up after the session with a response. So one of the questions asked, uh, how should a teacher intervene with a TS student who becomes physically aggressive when they become dysregulated? That's a great question. And usually there's going to be probably already a 504 or an IEP for a student who becomes physically aggressive so that there would be a plan like that teacher would know specifically what to do. If not, you'd want to put that into place, um, you know, because it, it just depends um, of the severity, right? Like obviously we want to keep a student from hurting himself and from hurting others is the is the biggest thing. And there are various ways that, that teachers do that. Sometimes they try to remove the student. Some schools are big where we will, you know, remove the rest of the students so that student can just stay and, and calm down. But that would be definitely something that you got um, the the parents and, and the school um, staff would want to think about and figure out ahead of time. That way there's a, you know, a routine, a procedure that, that they always know. Um, so everybody's familiar with what to do in that situation. Okay. And another question is, can OCD and TOCD uh, present at the same time in someone with Tourette? Is the treatment the same? Okay, so yes, a person, can have the classic OCD and also the Tourette OCD. Yes, that that definitely happens. There are. Um, I, I remember interviewing a, a teacher with Tourette syndrome who had definitely the classic OCD. I mean, she definitely had fears where she would tell me like sometimes she she always had a plan to leave the house like 20 minutes before she would actually need to leave because she would be checking the stove that many times just to make sure she turned it off, you know? But then there were also definitely symptoms that she had where she just had to do things until it felt a certain way or, you know, it, till it, she said it just right. So um, yes, it's, um, it's common. I would say it's not uncommon for somebody with Tourette syndrome to have both types of OCD. Okay, so someone else asked, uh, what do you recommend when your child does not want to, his classmates to know about his TS? Well, I can definitely sympathize because that was me for a long time. And maybe, so there just wasn't the knowledge like in the 80s. I feel like I had definite ticks that we all thought were just kind of like habits or quirks for years and years and years. And I didn't actually get diagnosed till I think it was the end of my junior year of high school. And by that point, I was in a weird space because, you know, my tics had been apparent for some time and I wasn't sure how to go about explaining it to others. And so really, you just have to really and truly, it's got to be whenever 
the, the, the child, the person with Tourette syndrome is ready. Because like I said, in my adult life, for years, I didn't even disclose to my students. And I was, you know, I guess a young enough, energetic mm -hmm. enough teacher, uh, teacher that kids would kind of take it in stride. And I feel like they also knew by and large that I didn't really like to talk about it. But once I was ready to talk about it, it sort of felt like a, a big weight had been lifted off my shoulders because now everybody knew I didn't have to try to worry about concealing and I didn't have to worry about ever, what everybody thought. And, and ironically, I don't know if it's ironic, but as it happened, once that, that, that weight came off my shoulders, my tics actually got a lot better. And I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I, I can't I can't say it's all because that I had told my students, but I felt like probably a, a, a significant part of that was I just didn't have the stress of worrying and wondering what everybody thought. And I feel like I just became more comfortable in my environment in the school and they became a lot better. So you have to respect if kids aren't ready to talk about it. Um, and I would just try to weigh out, you know, the pros and the cons, you know, when, when everybody knows you know, um, you don't have to worry, you know, it's, I would just try to present how, like, as I said in this slide, how it can be beneficial when, when kids have the, the knowledge and the, you know, the education, it's, they're way less likely to pick on somebody or be mean when they know that, hey, this is a medical condition, kind of like my sister who has, you know, diabetes. It, I just feel like people can, can humanize it more when they know it's a medical condition that a that a kid can't help. Yeah, definitely. So someone else asked, what are some of the most common strategies or accommodations for high school students? Um, they're finding that many elementary and middle school strategies don't translate as meaningfully to the high school realm. So I guess I'm, I probably just need a little bit more information for that one. It, if it's more like behavioral or if it's, um, strategies like to help them with dysgraphia. Ah, uh, see, I've only worked in a high school. So I'm trying the, the examples that I've used in are ones that I've I've used in the classroom, like with the, you know, moving the the desk to the side or allowing the kid to step out for a break or um, alternate assignments if it's dysgraphia. So I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm sure that there are you know, some accommodations that, that kids might age out of, but I don't know that I, I've never really used any in the, I'm, I'm not in the elementary um, setting, so I can't really think of different accommodations that someone might use for, for a, you know, a kid in, in elementary versus middle school or high school. Okay, so we actually only have time for one more question. Yeah, and I just want to say real quick, if that person could email you, like I'd be happy if I, if I had some more concrete examples, I'd be happy to get back with you, you know, responses after after the conference. Yes, definitely. Everyone can email support at Tourette.org with your questions and we'll send them to Jen, Dr. Stanger, and we'll get back to you. Also, the slides will be available afterwards for those asking. Um, so the last question, my son has a hard time getting started with some assignments, mostly creative writing and creative drawing. He excels at handwriting, reading, and spelling, and once started, does really well. But sometimes it takes one to two hours to get started. What can help him? I definitely think I, I get that. It's the, it's the mental block, it's the roadblock. And sometimes it kind of like this, the, the expression the bark is worth worse than the bite sometimes just thinking about it can be so overwhelming and what i've told students what i try to use with students is just like a brainstorm session where i say okay you've got uh whether it's two minutes or three minutes or five minutes jot things down especially if it's like writing a creative essay just possible topics it doesn't have to be complete sentence they don't have to you know they don't have to even relate to each other just brainstorm any type of idea you could have for this prompt and it's rapid fire you try to get as many out on paper and then once you have those examples um you know usually you can get started better also students that have trouble writing essays i feel like sometimes are just overthinking how they want it to sound so i say just act like you're telling your mom in a, in a text or an email just tell me what you want this story to be and then we can edit you know we can edit edit and make it look essay form you know and 
essay um, context and language. I said, sometimes they just, you know, I can tell, somebody can tell me they have no idea what they want to write, but they can talk to me elaborately for two or three minutes about what they want to say. So I try to con put it in the context of just act like you're typing me an email. And then once you get that little bit, it can sometimes be enough to get over that roadblock, that mental roadblock. Yeah, that's great advice. So uh, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. This is all the time we have for the session. Uh, once the session is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would greatly appreciate it if you guys all took the time to complete it and prov provide your feedback. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of this webinar. And we'll also post it on our YouTube channel within the week for those who were unable to participate today. So we encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar or for other resources and opportunities to connect. You can email again, support at Tourette.org or call 188-4-Tourette. Um, this presentation was pre presented free of charge thanks to our generous donors. If you appreciated the session, we welcome you to support the organization. We are currently in Tourette Awareness Month for those of you who may not know. And we welcome everyone to get out and get active through Miles for Tourette. And you can also share your story on mytourette.org. Um, yes, visit us at tourette.org to learn more and to give. And on behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.